Hello, my friends. Uh, today I want to talk to you about a hot topic, uh, replacement theology. Uh, but please, uh, first, uh, remember to subscribe, hit the notification bell, and give us a thumbs up. It really helps us. So, is replacement theology a form of anti-Semitism? Well, stick around and I will tell you all about it in this video. Uh, see, there is a, uh, uh, a theological approach to the Bible that has become increasingly popular within Christendom in general, uh, in evangelical uh, circles in particular, and that is known as supersessionism, or more commonly known as replacement theology. Simply put, replacement theology teaches that the Jewish people and Israel have been replaced by the church in God's prophetic plan and in God's program. Some will say that the Christian church has now become spiritual Israel and is currently the recipient of God's blessings originally intended for the Jewish people. That's, in, in a nutshell, replacement theology. Based on uh, that theological approach, Jewish people can still put their trust in Yeshua as their Messiah and become part of the church or body of Messiah. But God does not have a special plan for them and Israel is no longer part of God's prophetic program today and for the future. But is that what the Bible teaches? How literal do we have to be? Genesis 12, 1 through 3 tells us, and I quote, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and, for, and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make you, your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Close quote. So we learn that God made a covenant with Abraham and the Jewish people. It's actually the, 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 the first of five covenants that God made with Israel and the Jewish people. So that's the Abrahamic covenant. That covenant is eternal and unconditional. It is eternal because it cannot be broken since only God went through the split animals used to, uh, to seal the covenant, to ratify the covenant, as we read in Genesis 15, 9 through 17, and in other passages. But uh, Genesis 15, 9 through 17 reads like this, and I quote, He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and led each half over uh, against the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. Close quote. In 1 Samuel 15, 29, we also read, And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Malachi 3, 16, For the Lord do not change, therefore, for I the Lord do not change, therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Hebrews 13, 8, Yeshua the Messiah is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Additionally, it is unconditional because God simply said, I will, with no preconditions, in Genesis 12, 2-3, and uh, 15, 18. Except maybe 
uh, if you want to be picky, uh, for, the, the, for Abraham to start walking towards the land of Canaan, which of course he did. But there's really no precondition. God just said, I will. Listen to this, Genesis 12, 2 to 3. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you. I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God said, I will. He didn't say, if you do, I will. <clears throat> he said, I will. Unconditional. The Abrahamic covenant contains several provisions. Some were fulfilled in the days of Abraham. Some later in, in, in it will fulfilled later and some are still unfulfilled. <clears throat> so when did God change his mind? Or did he? Well, that's the point. He never did. Only a very creative approach to God's word can substantiate such a view. Any literal approach will not allow for replacement theology. The problem is that within 200 years after the closing of the biblical canon, theologian and early church fathers had a very allegorical approach to the Bible. A passage could have more than one meaning and it could just be symbolic if you wished it to be. The established, so, so they, 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 they established a, a, the foundation for replacement theology even though the, the name for it came much later. Additionally, to substantiate replacement theology, God would have to be a liar and a covenant breaker. The idea that God was done with ethnic Israel and, and that Christians were now the spiritual Jews was very appealing. That, uh, joined with human nature and anti-Semitism, grew into the monster that is replacement theology today. Yes, I do believe that replacement theology is a form of what I call soft anti-Semitism, but anti-Semitism nonetheless. Along with replacement theology, we also need to define preterism. The word preterism comes from the, uh, the, the Latin prater, which means past. Preterists believe that all prophecies of the Bible were fulfilled in AD 70, at the time the temple was destroyed. Thus, they teach that Yeshua's prophecies in Matthew 24, 25, Mark 13, and Luke 21 were all fulfilled in AD 70, which, of course, is, uh, is the wrong view. They are yet to be fulfilled. This view, among other things, also requires that the book of Revelation would have been written in AD 70, about 20 years or so before the date accepted by most biblical scholars. This is a view that was uh, not seriously considered until the middle of the 1600s when it was popularized by Dutch Protestant Hugo Grotheus. So preterists are proponents of uh, replacement theology simply because they see absolutely zero prophetic future for Israel. Yet, they cannot dismiss the promises made by God to Israel in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh. Thus, the logical step is the, of replacing Israel as recipients of God's promise. Now, note that they are always willing to receive God's blessing originally promised to Israel, to ethnic Israel, as to the curses, well, not so much. And that is another inconsistency. But another question is, didn't Israel's constant disobedience disqualify her from God's blessings? Well, that's a fair question. That is exactly what preterist and replacement theology prop proponents would have you believe. Again, they present their views in total ignorance of God's immutability. God never changes. A promise is a promise when it comes from God. They are the ones who decided that God must have changed his mind. A passage often quoted is Leviticus 26, 40-43, trying to prove that God's blessings to Israel are contingent on Israel's confession and repentance. Leviticus 26, 40-43, and I quote, But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers in their treachery that they committed against me, and also in walking contrary to me, so that I walked contrary to them and brought them into the land of their enemies. And if their 
um, uncircumcised heart is humbled and they make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and I will remember my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Amram and I will remember the land. But the land shall be abandoned by them and enjoy its Sabbath while it lies desolate without them and they shall make amends for their iniquity because this spurned my rules and their soul abhorred my statutes. But the, the same people who claim that God has replaced Israel based on that text totally ignore the rest of the passage. The, the, the next few verses in Leviticus 26, 44 through 45, where God clearly says that he will never renege on the covenant made with their forefathers. Leviticus 26, 44 and 45 reads like this, and I quote, Yet for all that when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not spurn them. Neither will I abhor them so as to destroy them utterly and break my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God. But I will, for their sake, remember the covenant with their forefathers whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations that I might be their God. I am the Lord. So God is again, close quote. So God is again confirming that he's not reneged on his covenant. He's not a liar. He's not a covenant breaker. Friends, a text without a context is a pretext. You cannot use half a verse or half a passage and ignore the rest. And that's a good case in Leviticus 26. As a matter of fact, if one tries to replace all the occurrences of the word Israel in the New Testament with the word church and see if the text remains coherent and contextual, it really doesn't work. If you indeed try that exercise, you will find out that it requires quite a bit of exegetical gymnastics to arrive at that faulty conclusion. Replacement theology, or even fulfillment theology, as it is also called, is nothing but a faulty approach to God's Word based on a human agenda blurred by anti-Semitism. I actually believe that replacement theology can both stem from and breed anti-Semitism. God is far from being finished with Israel, and He's not done with the church either. As we can read in 1 Corinthians 10.32, when He speaks of three different entities, and I quote, give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. If the church had replaced Israel, then there would not be mention of the Jews, and the church in the, same, in the same verse. But there they are, three different entities. If he had really changed his mind about his promise to Israel, what makes you so sure that God won't change his mind about the promises he made to you and to me? Like, let's say, salvation by faith alone in the shed blood of Yeshua? That would be tragic, wouldn't it? But of course, he won't change his mind on that either because God doesn't change and his promises stand forever. So replacement theology is not biblical and it is, it is indeed a form of soft anti-Semitism. We have to denounce it, we have to fight it, and we have to teach biblical truth. Thank you and be blessed.